So without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our first uh, speaker uh, who is online and I've seen he's online actually. Uh, so uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Neil Ferguson, um, who is um, um, working at Imperial College in London in the United uh, Kingdom, where he's head of the Department of Infectious uh, uh, Disease Epidemiology in the School of Public Health and also Vice Dean for Academic Development in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, and uh, I'm sure actually Neil Ferguson does hardly needs any introduction. He has been uh, really uh, um, instrumental uh, at bringing together uh, modeling uh, and uh, public health and really uh, showing the value of uh, modeling um, for informing uh, public health uh, decisions. And uh, during this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, he has been heading the Imperial College COVID-19 response team and uh, informing um, the, the government and, and uh, also um, on an, at, the, at an international uh, level, um, the, the evolution of the epidemic. And so uh, Neil, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sylvie, for that nice introduction. I'm sorry not to be there and uh, see so many familiar faces I see on the on the attendee list. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, I'm hoping everybody can see that. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the work we've been doing in the last really since about November of last year on characterizing uh, new variants of concern of um, SARS-CoV-2 and with a particular focus on aspects of the epidemiology, mostly transmissibility, and then impacts of um, particularly the Delta variant on vaccine effectiveness. Um, obviously, they've been a characteristic, new variants have been a characteristic of this epidemic, um, pandemic throughout, um, probably starting with D614G, which whilst it didn't come to the same level of public attention as Alpha and Delta, probably did have a significant impact on the epidemiology of the first wave of the pandemic in Europe compared with, for instance, what was seen in originally in Wuhan. Since then, as we know, we've seen two major replacements, Alpha and Delta. Alpha in you know, the last three months of last year, in the UK context and into this year, and then more uh, recently and even more explosively Delta, which is really now dominating in much of the world. Um, I'll talk about some work we did, which is now published, of course, on, on Alpha. Most of it is published. And then um, move on to Delta. So the Alpha variant B117, as everybody knows, originated almost certainly in the UK, uh, in the southeast, and ra rapidly rose to um, dominate the uh, viral population over a period really of about two months, two and a half months in the UK spreading there, out from there, dominated viral populations in Europe and, and further afield somewhat later. So when one is trying to characterize, I mean, this pattern going back a slide is indicative of, um, in, in, particularly in the context that the Kent variant and Alpha rose in the, on a background of quite a high incidence of SARS-CoV-2 in the UK, is indicative of some degree of selective sweep in the population of out competition of the old uh, lineages by, by this new lineage. And um, so one's interested in characterizing the, the level of transmission advantage of the virus. And Eric Voltz, others, Andrew Rambo, did a lot of work in that in, in late November, early December to come up with initial estimates. And effectively what you're trying to do is to um, look at the difference in real-time growth rates of um, the two different lineages, um, and they were doing analysis based on genomic data, correcting for sampling biases, and trying to then translate that into an estimate of the difference in the reproduction number. They were coming up with numbers of the order of about 50%. There was some evidence later of, of a decline over time, and I'll come back to why that might happen um, in a few slides time. Um, we also looked at, and I'll come on to this in a moment, whether there was much evidence of some sort of reduction in, in the uh, generation time of this new uh, variant, which could also explain faster real-time growth, because I say um, wouldn't explain the pattern of replacement we've seen. 
So we had a stroke of good luck, obviously, because of the 6970 um, spike deletion in uh, B117, which meant that because um, the UK relies on the attack path assay for about a third of its PCR testing, which includes spike as a target, um, alpha tested negative on that target. And so given the level of, of testing in the UK, we actually had a good proxy for um, the rise of alpha on a background of, of, of pre-alpha lineages uh, from routine PCR testing data, which is a lot more timely and more voluminous, voluminous than um, uh, even sequencing in the UK. And so that allows us to, allowed us to decompose the trajectory of the epidemic last autumn um, by a, a quite a fine scale, by weak and by quite small scale region. Um, so what you're seeing is, is the trajectory of the epidemic in multiple areas of England there, the overall case numbers, the thick curves at the top, and then for the ones which we could decompose into um, spike positive, spike negative, namely pre-alpha and alpha, you see the trajectories in those areas and the pink shaded areas are the timing of lockdowns. We had a second four week lockdown in November to December last year, schools stayed open and then finally went into a full blown, like the first lockdown, closing schools as well in January in response to alpha. And you see this pattern of those orange, small, thin orange curves going up during that second lockdown with the old lineage going down. That, told us, I mean, the fact that the same pattern was seen across the country, that there was a clear transmission advantage to alpha, but also that um, keeping schools open wasn't sufficient to uh, control the virus at that time. And so you can analyze that spatially disaggregated data over time this is using what they call the epidemia pa package developed by Sam Bat, Axel Gandhi and colleagues um, um, to look at um, temporal trends in the reproduction number locally and by variant and simultaneously fitting the two lineages. And that's what allowed us to, you know, what this scatter plot is showing the result of that. It's showing for each week and each location, the simultaneous estimate of, of the trends, uh, the reproduction number in um, alpha on the y-axis and pre-alpha lineages on the on the x-axis and the fact that all of those points whilst there's a lot of variability from place to place and week to week all of those points lying above the diagonal line is indicative of a substantial transmission advantage and whilst the advantage you estimate depends on the on the generation time you assume we were getting estimates of um, up to well central estimate here of about 80 percent albeit with quite wide credible intervals and just to, the, the spatial picture is quite important in ruling out other scenarios, namely, you know, could, could a reduction in the generation time of, of um, the new variant compared with the old variant explain the faster growth rate? Well, it could contribute, but certainly can't explain the, you know, the table I, I show here, which shows the number of area weak pairs where we saw alpha increasing, VOC greater than one, versus um, um, the uh, previous non-VOC um, uh, pre-alpha lineage is decreasing. And the fact that there were only three area weak pairs where we saw pre-alpha increasing and, and alpha decreasing, and 183 on the off-diagonal where we saw the reverse is, is clear indication of a transmission advantage. We did actually see some evidence for temporal changes in over, over time in the apparent transmission advantage. And by what, what I mean by apparent is the ratio of the reproduction number of alpha to pre-alpha lineages and thought quite hard about what might cause that. Um, and it's important to say that the reproduction number is a composite quantity. It, it measures particularly effective reproduction number just the at the, a particular point in time, the, the transmission intensity of a lineage. It's not a fundamental biological quantity. And so if you think about fundamental kind of infectiousness, maybe virus shed from some advantage, that's probably a more fundamental definition of transmission advantage, but that's quite related in a quite a complex way to, um, to the reproduction number, particularly in the, if you start thinking about um, social networks, 
So the reason it's a nonlinear relationship is, is just because, particularly during lockdowns, we only encounter a limited number of people and we encounter them repeatedly. And so the probability of transmission, for instance, to a household contact can saturate. And this gives this relationship between probability of transmission and underlying infectiousness, which you see there, P equals one minus E to the minus BT. What that means is if, for instance, you impose ever stricter social distancing measures on a population, then you're reducing their social network in general to their core, typically household contacts. <clears throat> and therefore they're getting fewer contacts per unit time, but those contacts are more intense. And what we would predict that does is reduce, and this is what's shown in those graphs there, for, for different levels of infectiousness advantage, the different curves, what we would expect to see in terms of the multiplicative uh, advantage measured through a ratio of reproduction numbers. So as the contact network becomes smaller and more intense, then the apparent transmission advantage reduces. In terms of biological mechanisms, I mean, uh, this is not news to many people, but a number of labs around the world have observed this. This is just routine testing data from, from the UK, looking at CT values of people testing positive over time uh, to the uh, two non-spike targets um, used in routine PCR testing in the UK. And you see this quite clear pattern. I should, should be a legend here, but the, the um, blue curves represent alpha and the red curves represent pre-alpha. And um, we saw substantially lower um, uh, CT values in, in people for al testing positive for alpha. I stratify by all positives, which are on the right-hand side there, and, and basically low-ish CT values, which are more definitive on the left-hand side. But the pattern is, is similar from the point in, point in time, about week 49 onwards, we were seeing substantially lower CT values. And while some of that could be explained, and there's a nice paper, many people will know, Hey et al, uh, explaining this, that you do see variation in mean CT values depending on how quickly lineages are growing. The magnitude of this difference is too large to be just down to dynamical effects like that. Just quickly, um, I mean, there've been a number of severity analyses of alpha, and we did a little bit of work in this, but I really, I mean, I'd say London School Group has done much more detailed work uh, as Public Health England, but we were specifically asked by the UK government to provide an alternative complementary analysis. And so this is examining, is there evidence that alpha um, generates more severe infection, a higher risk of hospitalization. So we un undertook a kind of endpoint analysis using linked PCR testing data linked to mortality data in three different measures. It's important to stratify by both time, geographic area and age at the very uh, least. We also uh, stratified by ethnic group and that analysis, um, summarizing quite a lot of work, suggested just focusing on the top line. This is looking at the uh, additional risk of mortality associated with um, alpha infection compared with pre-alpha infections, adjusting for those covariates I talked about, and found significant evidence for something up to about a 50% increase in mortality. I mean, reinforcing the work of, of other groups. Um, of course, one, there are some caveats to that. I mean, this analysis uh, covers a period of time uh, where hospital demand in the UK um, in relation to COVID was increasing dramatically and therefore uh, survival outcomes were, were decreasing. But by controlling for place and week, we, we hopefully have controlled for most of those effects. And I should say we're doing quite a lot of retrospective analysis on this now as well. Moving to Delta, we saw a very similar pattern in May of this year, albeit on a much lower incidence background than we had in November, December of last year with Alpha. And a very different pattern of introduction. Instead of um, Delta was imported into the UK um, through quite a large number of imports from India. Um, and we saw this pattern here, um, I should say Delta is, is in red here. Um, Alpha is in blue, 
and I'm plotting daily case incidents on a log two scale. And this is derived from genomic data on this plot. So it's, it's apportioning overall PCR test positives using real-time se um, sequencing to alpha versus delta. But across different regions, we saw a very similar pattern. This was still during lockdown in stages of lockdown in the UK, alpha was decreasing slowly in blue and delta increased really quite rapidly. And you can translate those incidence curves into estimates of the reproduction number over time. I should say there are significant founder and seeding effects here. So it was particularly strongly seeded into areas in the northwest of England. And so some of the early estimates of, of the effective reproduction number are very high. Um, and that reflects the fact it was difficult to disentangle you know, imported cases from travelers from, uh, from endogenous cases. But looking at the you know, whole of England in the bottom, um, uh, bottom right there, you see a significant difference in the estimated reproduction number uh, for delta versus alpha. And the black curve, I should say, shows the overall effective reproduction number of, of SARS-CoV-2 in England at that time. <clears throat> those those real-time estimates are generated, which are quite noisy, are generated using, um, many people know it, the package EPI-STIM. And Corey and colleagues did a nice piece of work in the last few months following the um, emergence of alpha, extending EPI-STIM to be able to estimate um, reproduction number for two lineages simultaneously and estimate a single transmission advantage, um, which is still in beta, but I encourage people to look at it. It's on, on, on the GitHub repo. Um, and we use that to estimate, you know, a single es generate single estimates for the transmission advantage of, of delta versus alpha over that time period I just showed you. <clears throat> I mean, coming up with values in the kind of 60 to 80% range for uh, serial interval, mean serial interval about 5.4 days close to the consensus estimate. Of course, if you assume a, a lower serial interval, then the transmission advantage is somewhat lower. And if you assume a higher trans, a serial interval, it's somewhat higher. And repeating that analysis we did for alpha using the epidemia package, using, again, we could use S gene target failure data from routine PCR testing because Delta tested positive on spike again compared with alpha. And that, again, <coughs> showed the same pattern as we'd seen uh, back in December of last year with nearly all of those points being below the line in this case, indicating a transmission advantage for um, S gene positive uh, virus compared with S gene negative with very similar estimates of transmission advantage. And to conclude, and we've been doing quite a lot on work on vaccine effectiveness overall in recent months, um, but there are two different ways you can get it the effect of a new lineage on vaccine effectiveness. One is just direct estimation, and I'll come to that in a moment, and challenges around it in a highly vaccinated population. The other is, is a rel completely relative analysis. And so what I did, uh, this was back in May, <clears throat> to look at a number of risk factors associated with Delta, but vaccine effectiveness, turned, vaccine impact, so I say vaccine status turned out to be an important one, is, is do a logistic regression of all COVID cases in England. And, and here I'm modeling the occurrence of Delta among Delta and Alpha cases. So what are the risks, if, if you've got Delta and Alpha co-circulating, what are the things which predict you getting Delta versus Alpha? Looking at covariates such as region, weak age, ethnic group and vaccination status. And so clearly in, in the sort of invasion and selective sweep or, or <coughs> then time is going to be an important predictor. And some of the curves there show the log odds over time, which are clearly increasing in multiple regions. There was a lot of regional variability. There was initial variability by ethnic group because it was particularly seeded into people of, of Indian heritage in, in the UK, not very much by age. And, and the model predicts it well, but something which came out very early, which was Concerning, if not completely unexpected, was that vaccination status was quite significant. And here, vaccination status, we, we stratified into base, basically post-dose one, but not having had dose two, post-dose two, um, more than I think we used seven or 14, I can't quite remember, 14 days post-dose two. 
And there are two there were two vaccines in common use in the UK at that time, AstraZeneca and Pfizer. And what we're estimating in the odds ratio of being a Delta case versus an Alpha case, given your vaccination status. And that really can be interpreted as a scaling, approximately a scaling of the relative risk of infection. So you can translate it back into how much does, has Delta compromised uh, vaccine efficacy. The fact that all of these odds ratios are greater than one indicates that the vaccine effectiveness is lower for Delta than Alpha, but it varied significantly by vaccine. So if we assume, and this is the limitation of the analysis, you have to assume or have some other prior estimate of the vaccine effectiveness against alpha, but if it was after two doses of Pfizer, B is 95% for alpha, then these, these odds ratios imply a V of 90% for, for delta. But if, for instance, post-dose two AstraZeneca, V is 75%, and I should be talk, should say here, we're talking about vaccine effectiveness against mild symptomatic disease, test and PCR positive. 75% for alpha, then it drops to all the way to 50% for delta. And so we were estimating, particularly for the AstraZeneca vaccine, quite significant drops in VE. The second way we've been looking at, at it, which is quite a lot more challenging, is, uh, and I'll be interested to see uh, Ron's talk after, the next talk after this on the Israeli um, VE analyses, but is basically replicating those whole population cohorts. And so here I restricted the analysis um, when we started it to individuals aged 40 plus, because they account for 99% of deaths in, in, due to SARS-CoV-2, and it makes the modeling somewhat more tractable, but still gives a cohort of 27.4 million individuals in England. And we linked PCR confirmed cases to hospitalization episodes, um, to deaths associated with COVID and to the uh, national vaccine or immunization database um, used in England. And then the one challenge of these analyses is properly accounting for people who don't appear on any of those databases, and namely unvaccinated individuals who haven't been COVID cases. And there we use a kind of synthetic population approach using ONS denominators supplemented by some data on risk group membership and undertook a Poisson regression to um, stratified by area, week, age band, ethnic group, care home status, and allowing for interactions between area, week and age band to estimate um, basically looking at the incidence in each strata and, and then estimate um, vaccine effectiveness comparing vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. The plot you see there is just how vaccination progressed in different broad age bands in England over time um, <clears throat> from the beginning of this year onwards. Um, initially, vaccine rollout was very rapid in, in the UK as a whole, but it slowed in, in recent months. And so, I analysed two different time windows, first of all up to um, about May of this year, weeks 1 to 6, epidemiological weeks 1 to 16, and you see the um, crude incidence uh, in, by vaccination status and by, and by age in the plot on the left hand side, which shows clearly the protective effect of vaccination. This is plotting deaths per 100,000 in each strata, with the grey being unvaccinated. So the clear protective effect of vaccination. And then <clears throat> the um, resulting uh, vax VE estimates stratified by um, uh, vaccine, by broad age group, 70 plus versus 40 to 70, um, and then by um, different periods post-dose one, for the two first points, um, less than 21 days post-dose one and more than 21 days post-dose one, but before post-dose uh, dose two, and then less than 14 days post-dose two, 14 to 70 days post-dose two, and 70 here to 139 days post-dose two. We, because of the time period, we had nobody going beyond that time. And what you see is really quite high, particularly where we have power to resolve it in, in the elderly groups, I mean, really quite post-dose two vaccine efficacy effectiveness against death in excess of um, 95% for both vaccines. <clears throat> a hint of um, somewhat lower V in younger age groups, but that is likely to be confounded by risk group membership 
clinically extremely vulnerable people were vaccinated first and they probably make up most of the people the younger people in the vaccinated categories contributing to deaths at that time similar levels of protection against hospitalization this is all the against alpha i should say <clears throat> and and high but lower uh, protection against just mild symptomatic um, disease now, if we jump forward to Delta, and I'm sorry, the incidence, I didn't check it fast. <clears throat> I didn't check it enough. And the incidence plots don't make much sense on the left-hand side because the uncertainty in some of the incidence measures is so great, you can't really see the, the detail. But um, moving to the, this is now the Delta period, um, really from um, mid-June onwards, about a 10-week period. Um, I have to cut off, and I can't remember what week, I mean, it's basically end of July, a month before the current time to allow for follow-up for death and reporting of hospital episode statistics. But you can come up, you can estimate, again, uh, V in similar uh, categories, um, post-dose one, post-dose two, now with an additional category of more than 140 days post-dose two. The, the, and I will summarize briefly in the interest of time, the, the key conclusions from that analysis that in, in <clears throat> common with nearly all other analyses of, of V against Delta, it's lower than against Alpha, especially against infection or mild disease. Um, looking at those bottom, that bottom plot against symptomatic disease, as well as seeing a big difference between age groups here, we see um, those VE estimates are no longer anywhere near 90%. They're down at the maximum of 80%, but 140 days post dose two down at 60% um, or so, even for um, <coughs> Pfizer, much lower for AstraZeneca. Um, we're finding trends, and there are caveats to this, but trends that VE is lower in older people than in um, younger people. It's considerably lower for AstraZeneca than Pfizer for all outcomes. There's clear evidence of waning against, of protection against mild disease, which appears to be happening quite quickly, and against hospitalization, though that seems to be slower, but still significant, but thankfully not as yet against uh, protection against death. There are lots of limitations to this analysis, and it's, it's very much still work in progress. Um, uh, being an observational study where you only have a small fraction of the population who are unvaccinated in some age groups. It's not clear that um, they really are comparable in terms of their exposure risks um, with the vaccinated group. And that may explain some of the, there are some inconsistencies in terms of some of the trends with covariates and in V against uh, Delta versus Alpha, which would be unexpected. And we have quite imperfect denominator data. The thing which would make the biggest difference is really good data on risk group membership for unvaccinated individuals, um, because that will allow us to stratify the analysis by risk group factor much better. And I'll stop there just with a few reflections. I mean, just that all of the analyses I've shown you are fundamentally observational studies and they are challenging. And you always have to be correcting for um, potential uh, biasing effects. And when you're looking at replacement of one lineage by another, there's a limited time window where you can resolve and estimate these things. Once, once alpha was dominant, we no longer had a comparative group once delta was dominant, similarly. Um, interesting, I mean, I don't have an answer to this, but it'd be interesting to see whether the transmission advantage we've estimated for initially alpha of the order of say 40, 50%, maybe even higher, then delta at least 50% over alpha. If you take those numbers literally, you'd be estimating now SARS-CoV-2 delta could have a basic reproduction number somewhere in the range six to nine, which would make it one of the most you know, transmissible respiratory viruses we've ever seen, far more transmissible than influenza A. But it's unclear whether that is, we can really do that as yet. The me mechanistic basis of the advantage is still unclear, but there are hints that you know, just higher peak viral load may be contributing both for alpha and delta. Lots, though, of epidemiological uncertainties. We, we can't be confident. And there is some, you know, limited ni and nice, nice analyses, some evidence that we have, may have seen some shortening of the generation time with both alpha and delta. 
Um, longer term, I think it's unclear if, if SARS-CoV-2 can truly, and I know you'll be discussing it in this meeting, be a bit flu A-like and drift antigenically forevermore, or whether there's a kind of rather more constrained antigenic space. But clearly we've been seeing signs of partial immune escape with Delta um, compared with Alpha. And I'm currently, and this is a little teaser of joint work with Ajit Lalvani and his attack uh, consortia, uh, um, uh, household study, which is the largest of its kind in the um, UK, currently interested in relating the within host dynamics, and those are viral kinetic profiles in uh, different subjects infected by you know, different lineages uh, to those transmission characteristics. And I would say watch that space. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neil, uh, for this uh, uh, very uh, comprehensive um, talk. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. I will first invite questions from the floor. So if you could move to the microphone, I identify yourself, please. Okay, I'll start. Simon? Uh, yeah, uh, Simon Cochmes from uh, Institut Pasteur. Thank you, Neil, that was fantastic. Uh, can you comment on your assessments for the autumn uh, in the UK? Do you what do you expect to see in the UK? <laughs> Thank you. Not really a science question at the current time, really. Um, it is interesting. Um, we've been surprised. I think everybody's been surprised by quite what we've seen in the last three months. I mean, we saw a big uptick in infections in July, best associated with the euros. We can't be definitive. And then, at least on a logarithmic scale, basically flat incidence for the last ten weeks, uh, which is as you know, quite an unusual thing to see happen. Um, um, we're seeing evidence of case numbers and in infection incidents increasing at the moment in school-aged children, basically, but decreasing in other age groups and hospitalizations are declining. It is incredibly difficult to project what we're going to see in the next few months. Um, as you know, I mean, seasonal factors, climate and the like will likely increase transmission. We're still at contact rates in the population which are we think well below um, pre-pandemic levels and we have almost certainly waning immunity in the vaccinated population albeit that will be counterbalanced now by the rollout of booster doses and to some extent by at least one dose of vaccine being given to teenagers putting all that together I would hesitate to predict what we'll see if I I think some degree of increase in the next few months is likely, but whether it will impose you know, real challenges in terms of healthcare demand I, is very difficult to predict. I don't think we'll see a huge surge in mortality to anything like second wave levels. One thing is clear is that vaccine protection against very severe outcomes is holding even for Delta and shows less sign of decaying. Mario? Yes. Hi, Marion Koopmans here, uh, Neil. Um, I have a question about the uh, balancing of booster dose in uh, all over 65 versus natural boostering because of circulation and more transmissibility or yeah, less protection from, from infection. Um, has, how do you phase that into your deliberations because it is a you know it's one that we are struggling with also against the call from who to not go for boosters uh, as long as possible so i mean as we all know if you've been vaccinated and infected um the evidence is you have a very high level of protection probably comparable with having a booster dose on top of you know three doses of pfizer I think the challenge is, though, that um, particularly with Delta, and if you're four to six months out from your second dose of Pfizer, then, I mean, uh, my, my analysis, and that, that of you know, many other groups around the world, would suggest that whilst you still have a high level of protection against death, against going to ICU, the level of protection against, let's say, pneumonia, being hospitalized, um, requiring oxygen, um, has does decline and probably declines from initial 95% down to as low as you know 80%, 85% after six months. 
And so that poses, you could say, yes, you can let those people get infected and they won't die and um, they'll then be very immune. But those, that minority of people who will end up in hospital poses a seasonal pressure on the healthcare system, as well as having health impacts on those people themselves. And so I think in the UK, that's what we're struggling with, um, that the UK NHS is already, and we're not even into full winter, is already highly stressed by um, combination of the kind of backlog of untreated people for other conditions and uh, ongoing COVID demand and really just can't cope with very much more. And that really has focused minds, I think, within the government on getting boosters out going forward. I don't see more questions from the floor. That's yes, oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Arnaud. Good, good morning, Arnaud Tarantola, formerly from Pasteur and uh, now with Santé Publique France. You, you were saying that um, in, in the UK, at least, there are lower levels of social contacts than we had pre-pandemic. Do we have, do you have any evidence that, uh, or, or any comments or thoughts on the fact that perhaps, perhaps these contacts being reduced, um, we're not getting micro booster shots from exposure to the virus on a daily basis. My question is basically, are being vaccinated um, is protecting us, but does the immunity wane in areas where there are less social contacts quicker uh, than in areas where you have social contacts? It's a very interesting question, and we might even be able to have a look at it. Um, obviously, in the sort of survival analysis I just presented, we censor people if they ever test positive, you know, PCR positive for, for SARS-CoV-2, but it doesn't rule out the idea that uh, a significant fraction of, of the vaccinated, unvaccinated population will be getting particularly mi you know, micro boosters. Um, the way, yeah, so we haven't looked at it, um, but we might be able to do an analysis which looks at whether there's any evidence of a difference in V or a difference in the rate of waning uh, as a function of, of incidence in local areas. And, and the analysis I showed is stratified by quite small, it's called upper tier local authority, but 200 of them in England. So there's a lot of heterogeneity there to potentially explore. So I don't know the answer to your question, but it's an interesting hypothesis. So we'll have the last two quick questions, Arnaud. Yes, good morning, Neil. Uh, Arnaud Fontanet, Institut Pasteur. Um, and I just wanted to have your thoughts regarding the influenza and RSV um, season upcoming. Yeah, so it's been interesting in, in the UK, we did see a very long, well, the timing was not at all typical, quite a big surge of RSV a couple of months ago now, which is now declining. Um, and that, that probably was mopping up um you know children who had not been exposed for the, the prior year as i'm not an rsv expert and we haven't worked on it ourselves but um, it's interesting that it's now declining and um, flu i think is the big question um clearly we've had no exposure to flu for you know over 18 months now in the northern hemisphere to speak of and um i think there is a real potential for quite a large seasonal flu epidemic whether it remains damped by the fact that we estimate, I mean, this is based on kind of the COMICS data and the contact survey data collected by um, uh, folk at the London School, but also some analysis and mobility data, that contact rates may still be only at about 70, 75% of normal. Even a 20, 25% drop in contact rates would be enough to have quite a big impact on seasonal flu transmission, which exists at that kind of endemic threshold of a reproduction number of just above one when you get a seasonal flu epidemic. So as yet, I, I wouldn't want to call, I know a lot of people have said we have a risk of, of a large seasonal flu epidemic this year. That, that is possible, but I don't think one can definitively call it. Um, we will see, I mean, basically we will see what happens. Uh, I think it's a real concern for policymakers though, because 
I mean, it's highly likely we'll continue to see circulation at reasonably high levels of COVID through the winter and having seasonal flu on top could pose, you know, again, significant additional burdens on, on health systems. Very last question and a quick answer, please, Neil. We're <laughs> yep. running out of time. Good morning, Neil. This is uh, Slim Abdul Karim from South Africa, Capri. Sir. Hi. Just a quick question around beta. <laughs> you had in the UK multiple introductions of beta, uh, you know, perhaps less so than the introductions you had of delta, but beta never really took off. And I'm just trying to get your sense. Is it just a transmissibility issue or is it that in the UK had this very aggressive approach to every case of Delta that Alpha Beta that was found, uh, or is it a combination of those? How do you explain that Beta never really took off to the same extent in the UK? And we've done a little bit of analysis of this. Um, so you're right, most of the Beta introductions were occurring at a time of strict lockdown in England, um, and therefore, even if they got in, there was a limited of opportunity for transmission, but still there were you know, well over a hundred introductions of beta into, into the UK. And I think if, if it had had a transmission advantage over alpha, it would have likely slowly spread in frequency. Um, not definite. I mean, the reproduction number could still have been below one, but my, I think my, my conclusion is that just alpha was more transmissible. And so in that context, um, context where the lockdown was causing the reproduction number of alpha to be below one, beta was even further below one as it was being introduced and really couldn't spread. Thank you very much, Neil. Thanks again for this excellent presentation. Thank you.